Red symbolizes the joys of life. Black is sadness and solitude. I'd be unhappy if I couldn't paint. It was an urge. I had to do it. What inspired me? My emotions. If I was feeling sad and lonely, I painted black pictures. I still do that now. I've been almost everywhere in the world. I felt lonely everywhere. I was alone everywhere. As a child, I always drew and painted, but my father was opposed to art. He didn't want me to paint, but my mother encouraged me. My father was a businessman, and my mother was a sculptor. It was an arranged marriage, and they were not compatible at all. My mother was extremely unhappy. The painter Susanna was born Susanna Schuler in Vienna in 1927. She spent her early childhood in the relative security of a middle-class Jewish family. Befitting their status, the family lived in a large apartment in the center of Vienna, not far from the State Opera House. Susanna's father owned a successful cufflink factory in the Jewish quarter of Vienna's 15th district, the foundation of the family's affluence. Then everything changed. In March 1938, one of the darkest chapters of Austria's history began. I was only 11 years old but I knew what was going to happen. I could feel it. The 11-year-old Susanna turned to art to conquer her fears, a dangerous undertaking at the time. We would watch the streets from the windows of our apartment. Then, one night, we escaped. My mother, my brother and I took a train to Switzerland. I was afraid at the border, but they let us through. We had very little luggage. While Susanna, her mother and her brother spent several months in the apparent safety of Switzerland, Jewish shops were looted and synagogues burned in their hometown and in the Jewish quarter of the 15th district. I saw all these men from the SA running in with canisters. And soon it was all on fire. The whole street was filled with people watching. And people I knew thought it was fantastic. Some people just stood there watching silently. But there were people who were thrilled. Some woman said something like, oh, how delightful. That's what she said, delightful. The future of the factory was the subject of heated arguments. Some wanted to be rid of the competition posed by the Arch-Jew Schuler. But the party recommended the business remain open so that the Reich could take advantage of the urgently needed income generated by exports. Eventually, the factory was sold to a valued member of the party for one Reichsmark 
and an Aryanization compensation of 3,000 Reichsmarks. Meanwhile, the Schuler family continued their escape. The next stop of their involuntary journey was London. However, England provided only a brief respite. Susanna and her brother were able to attend Northwood College and then the Chelsea Polytechnic School. But eventually, the war caught up with them. We spent every night in London in the air raid shelter. First it was the shelter under a church. Then it was the shelter under the Montreal Hotel. We had to sleep in rows on the floor. There was a man lying next to me and I felt his hand stroking me. But my mother was there as well. The English referred to the month-long bombing campaigns of the German Luftwaffe against civilian targets in the United Kingdom as the Blitz. Hundreds of people were killed, most of them civilians. The Schuler family's flight continued. They were able to find places on the last civilian ship to depart England for the United States. On the one hand, 13-year-old Susanna found herself hoping for a brighter future overseas. On the other, the trauma of her war experiences had left her feeling alone and at the mercy of the enemies that surrounded her, a theme that would resurface throughout her life. The family finally arrived in New York and set about building a new life in the Lower Broadway District, an area popular with recent immigrants. It was very hard. My parents had to start over again with no money. They opened a shop on Broadway, and I frequently had to work for pocket money. I even took a job in a factory, but they fired me when I started painting there. While her parents focused all their attention on setting up a new existence, Susanna increasingly felt abandoned and neglected. During her artistic education, Susanna met the teacher Bez Afrayim, who had emigrated from Poland in the 20s. At the time, she was 14, and he was 50. He was an American who lived in America. We rarely had food at home because my parents worked such long hours and he would give me food. Then he would take me to exhibitions to meet other artists. And he called me Soshana from the Hebrew form of Susanna. I started to sign my name, Sashana. I would paint at home, then show him the picture the next day. I carried on painting. And eventually, I became his lover, and then his wife. Then he had a car. We collected gas and drove all across America for a year. It was wonderful. We ate and slept in the car. We 
First we went to Los Angeles, slowly. We were there for six months and I painted a lot. We made portraits of all the artists and famous people there. Thomas Mann, Franz Werfel, Franz Werfel on his deathbed. That was the first time that I saw a dead person. We also painted Bruno Walter, Arnold Schönberg, as well as many famous artists and even scientists. In 1946, the couple returned to New York, where their son, Amos, was born. Bayes Afroyim returned to teaching, providing the young couple with a moderate income. The opportunity for an extended visit to Cuba soon arose, as a result of Afroyim's many contacts within the left-wing political movement. I was so happy to leave the cold of New York in winter and travel to Cuba. We spent a year there. I did a lot of painting and I had my first exhibition in Havana. However, the harmonious time in Cuba was to be the last such period for the family. We had our son and a good place to live. We had a lovely terrace where he could enjoy the sun and I could paint. It was very pleasant in Cuba, and then we returned to New York. An unpleasant new reality awaited the family in the United States. The government had changed. McCarthyism had arrived, if you remember. My husband was very left-wing, and we were afraid. A lot of Americans left because of McCarthyism, including our son's doctor and many of our friends. During this period, the Republican Senator Joseph McCarthy initiated his witch hunt against anything he considered communist. It became too dangerous for Bey Zafroyim, an active member of the Communist Party, to remain in America. For months, the couple and their two-year-old son traveled throughout Europe, desperately seeking an opportunity to establish themselves as artists. It was a hard life, particularly for young Amos. We traveled all over Europe, including Holland, Vienna, England, Poland, and even Czechoslovakia, which was renowned as an artist's paradise. Of course, this wasn't the case. We ended up in Israel. Life was no easier there. With all its attention devoted to establishing the new country, Israel had no need for artists. I can still remember taking a bus along the highway. The road was unsealed. It was just sand, and the edges were marked with oil drums, painted black and white. That was the edge of the road. These are just flashes of memory. Things were going very badly for us. I asked my father to send money, and he said he would only send money if I got divorced. My parents always disliked my husband. They wanted me to marry a rich businessman. 
My mom was einverstanden mit der My husband agreed to the divorce, so we separated. It took an hour and cost five dollars. In 1950, Sushana returned to post-war Vienna with her young son. Initially, she registered at the University of Applied Arts in Vienna. Two years later, she transferred to the Academy of Fine Arts, where she studied under Sergius Pausa, Albert Paris Gutterslow, and Herbert Berkler. However, the academic approach to art at the time did not meet her expectations. In her früh phase, in her early period, there is possibly some influence from the art of the interwar period. In broad terms, she chose a realist, figurative and somewhat expressive form. This can be explained by the art that was common in Austria in the years between the wars. In Österreich existiert hat, heraus erklären lässt. Eventually, she consciously changed direction and sought out a form that suited her character better and which expressed her search for autonomy in a more adequate manner. Her quest for autonomy and artistic independence drove Sashana to make a decision that would have serious repercussions. She put her son into the care of her father and a foster family and left Vienna. The relationship with my mother, Sashana, has always been difficult for both of us. Of course, an abandoned child always has issues, but through her art, we've grown closer. We've made peace with each other, and actually everything is all right. The Rue de la Grande Charmier in the Montparnasse Artists' Quarter in Paris. Sushana was among the thousands of hopeful artists who streamed into the French capital in the 1950s. One of the few female artists to do so. To this day, the district remains home to innumerable galleries and art schools. Most of the arriving artists of the 1950s shared one common trait, poverty. They lived in cheap hotels like the former Hotel Liberia, Among them was Samuel Beckett, memorialized on this plaque. Alongside the photographer Man Ray and his model Kiki D. Montparnasse. Sashana's former studio is located here, in this small courtyard. Today, it is a comfortable hotel room. I finally found a studio, but it was damp and cold. The walls were so damp that they almost collapsed. I had a glass roof and the light was good, but sometimes the glass cracked and it would rain into the studio. I had no bathroom and the toilet was out on the corridor. I had to go to the Bain Public to wash. Even Giacometti went there to wash because he had no bathroom. It was a good place to work, but not to live. Paul Gauguin had had the same studio, and I know why he moved to Tahiti, because it was so damp and cold. One of Sushana's paintings from the period shows her surrounded by other artists. They are visibly starving, ill, emaciated figures. Very few archived any level of recognition, 
The remaining authors, musicians and painters lived in a miserable, hopeless existence. Sushana slowly began to find her own style. Removed from the representational and figurative forms, this development is visible in her paintings of the Montmartre area around Sacre Coeur Basilica at night. Despite all the challenges, Paris was the ideal place for artists to settle at the time. This was largely due to the atmosphere and the magic of the city itself. Sashana had finally achieved her goals, at least temporarily. It was very difficult to withdraw from the pressures of one's immediate surroundings in order to concentrate on art, particularly in the 1950s. It may have become somewhat easier in the 1960s, but in the 1950s she found herself in exceptional circumstances. The loneliness this caused is often reflected in her paintings. Alone in Mexico, one of the many paintings that documents Sushana's sense of isolation. A closer look at the oil painting reveals her to be surrounded by small figures, masks, faces, animals and ghosts. Rainwater frequently dripped through the leaky glass roof of Sushana's studio, landing on her watercolors and altering the paintings. The artist then transferred this effect to her oil paintings, dripping turpentine on the surfaces to give them a unique structure. Any artist who could moved to Paris, from all over the world. Paris was particularly good for painting. Many artists came to visit me in my studio, and I visited them. We inspired each other. Back then, it was even more difficult for a woman to establish herself than it is today. I spent 20 years in Paris. Every now and then I sold something. Jean Cassou, the director of the Museum of Modern Art in Paris, was a great help. The museum bought two of my paintings. My father bought me a flat, so I was finally able to live normally. It was a very nice flat, and the studio was only used for work. But the first 10 years were very difficult. Her first exhibitions gave rise to some initial success. At the same time, Sushana began to move further and further from representational art and towards abstract expressionism and the art a formel movement. She became an integral part of the Paris scene associating with the philosopher and author Jean-Paul Sartre, as well as the Swiss painter and sculptor Alberto Giacometti, who became a close friend. I was at an exhibition in Paris, and one of the exhibits was a sculpture by Picasso. I was examining it when Picasso approached me, and he said he would like to talk to me, but he never had any time in Paris. He said that if I was ever in Valoris, I should come and visit him, which I did. The invitation to the warm south of France was a welcome excuse for Sushana to escape the cold, dark winter of Paris. Coat 
d'Azur in late winter. It is quiet, and the tourist season is still a long way off. Beneath the clear blue skies between Antibes and Valoris, the signs of the genius Lotzi can be found everywhere. In the early 1950s, one of the greatest artists of the time, the Spanish painter and sculptor Pablo Picasso, had settled in the south of France. In 1954, he resides in the Villa La Galoise, high up among the orange groves of the small town of Valoris. In Cannes, I bought some paper and a pen. I took them to Picasso and told him to draw a portrait of me. He did it, just like that. From this point on, Sushana was far more than just a member of Picasso's entourage. The pleasant light of the south and the relaxed Mediterranean atmosphere inspired the artist to create light-hearted, colorful paintings, far removed from her fear and loneliness. And then Picasso made her an offer. He wanted me to stay with him. I went back to my hotel in Cannes and considered it, but I didn't return to Picasso. I was afraid that I would become pregnant and then run away six months later. And what happened to Picasso's portrait? Unfortunately, I had to sell it. In 1957, China is going through a period of upheaval. It is hoped that the so-called Great Leap Forward will provide prosperity for the population and ensure their continued existence. The country has yet to experience the famines that will eventually cost millions of lives. The population is enthralled to Mao Zedong and the Communist Party. Far from the politics of daily life, Sashana documents her impressions armed only with a film camera and the goodwill of the regime. I was invited to China. They organized a wonderful exhibition for me. I applied for a visa and within a month they provided me with an invitation. They paid for my return flight and the transport of the paintings. In Hangzhou in southern China, I was taught by Chinese painters. It was very nice there. Art informel always included aspects that had a certain formal affinity with Japanese or Chinese calligraphy. This was probably a personal attempt on Soshana's part to research the roots of this form of artistic expression for herself.
I always traveled in winter. I've been all over the world, India, Africa, everywhere. I greatly enjoyed India. I visited 14 times. It was an interesting country, and I wanted to study the Hindu and Buddhist philosophies. Hinduism and Buddhism. I loved India, and I was friends with Dr. Radhakrishnan. He was the vice president and then became president. He received the Nobel Prize for philosophy. He advised me to always do what I really want to and follow my feelings. And that's what I did. I tried various drugs. I took LSD, hash and marijuana. I wanted to try those mushrooms from some woman on a mountain, but I never made it there. In Bali, I finally took the mushrooms and started to paint. I couldn't stop painting. I could see everything differently. I have everything different. I could stop the drugs at any time. I didn't need them. Then I traveled through Africa. I painted a portrait of Albert Schweitzer. He was extremely vain and insisted that I paint him without his glasses, although he always wore them. Her expanded travels took Sushana all over the world. At the time, this was by no means a regular occurrence, particularly for a single woman. She could be found in both the Middle and the Far East, in Moscow as well as New York, where she stayed in the infamous Chelsea Hotel. Like many artists before her, she paid her stay with paintings. I was at home everywhere and nowhere, all over the world. I felt lonely everywhere. I was alone everywhere. Throughout her life, Sushana always kept a diary, documented her journeys on film and interviewed artists and people from the art world. Her collection of videotapes, audio recordings and manuscripts, as well as the rest of her estate, were admitted to the archives of the Austrian National Library in 2008. Sashana's diaries, in which she recorded her innermost feelings, in searing honesty, are currently being examined by the student Selina Novak, an artist in her own right. To create something in art means sacrifice. Paying a big price of happiness, especially for a woman, it's very difficult. It means devoting yourself completely. How can you do that when you have a family and children? Yet I long for a home, my husband, my Amos. What happened just breaks my heart. I feel so very sad and lonely. I have no words for it, just paint and canvas. Sashana's hopes of having her own happy family would remain unfulfilled all her life. However, she did make friends. In 1953, she met the gallery owner Max Borlach in Zurich. He was convinced of her artistic talent and was as supportive as possible. Borlach purchased more than 1,000 of her paintings over the years, selling the majority on to customers.
Sashana exhibitions remain an integral part of the gallery's repertoire, despite the fact that the collaboration with the artist was not always easy. Oleg's oldest daughter took over the gallery after his death and clearly remembers the difficulties. My father she would sometimes get on my father's nerves. He would sigh, and when I asked him what the trouble was, he would say, Sashana is coming tomorrow, and she's a wonderful artist and so strong, but she's always complaining. She never stops. About eight years ago, Sashana came by to the gallery, and we hadn't seen each other for a long time. She'd lost her red jacket, and she was making a big deal of it. I said, you know, Sashana, I also travel a lot, and I know how it is, as if I traveled with you. You, you frequently visit Thailand and India. She acknowledged it and, and I said, and I know that when you're there, you're very awake, and happy and independent. She looked at me as if she'd been caught out and then she smiled and it was a key moment in our relationship. <laughs> By 1974, Sushana had left Paris for good and had lived in Israel for two years. The outbreak of the Yom Kippur War prevented her from settling there, and she returned to New York once again. She felt at home near Washington Square, in Greenwich Village, surrounded by art schools and young artists. But she still disliked the winters. New York was so cold in winter. I went to Mexico, where I was invited to exhibit my work at the Palacio de Bellas Artes. It's a large museum with large walls for large paintings. I had no paintings with me, so I rented a house in Cuernavaca, bought canvas and paints and painted for the exhibition. Cuernavaca is a lively little Mexican town about an hour's drive south of Mexico City. The town and the surrounding areas have been popular with immigrants and European refugees from the Nazis since the 1940s. In the 1960s, large numbers of young men desperate to avoid the Vietnam War draft arrived here. Sushana too repeatedly sought refuge in the area. The artist developed a strong connection to the region, a bond that also influenced her painting. She repeatedly returned to the themes of contrast and conflict within the society and the enormous class differences, as well as to the theme of escape. The refugees at that time, they came from Europe uh, from all countries in Europe, the anti-fascist group, mostly communist, Trotskites also, came and many of them lived in the house of my parents, who had like a house that rented rooms for them. And they went to Cuernavaca especially to rest, to get sun, because Cuernavaca is a very sunny city. Sushana's exhibitions were not limited to Mexico. Her paintings could be seen in the Chateau Grimaldi in Antibes in southern France, now better known as the Musée Picasso, as well as in the United States, Japan, England, Italy, and any number of other countries around the world. A 
and in Austria's Wiener Neustadt, the exhibition also resulted in Sushana's first appearance on Austrian television, a somewhat surreal performance. I think we don't see everything, our mind and so on. We're too... we can't see everything. There's a greater truth happening in the world that we can't comprehend. And humans are so selfish and are destroying the world too quickly. To illustrate the destruction of the world forcefully, Sashana used avant-garde methods in her paintings, such as the use of sand, For eight decades, Sashana experienced war and destruction, both directly and indirectly. The dramatic images of the Balkan War touched her deeply and inspired her painting, Sarajevo. The violent assault on the Israel team in the Olympic Games in Munich in 1972 affected her. as did the attack on the World Trade Center in 2001. In 1985, Sashana returned to where her life's journey had begun. However, the artist, who had spent her life constantly traveling and in motion, still resisted any definitive notion of settling down. Although she owned her own studio in Vienna, she continued to travel as often and for as long as she could. In 1997, the year of her 70th birthday, the following interview took place. Welcome, Sushana. You've been in Vienna for 12 years now. Can the art scene in Vienna be compared to the ones you've experienced in the past? I'm very lonely in Vienna. In Paris, I just had to walk down the street to a coffee house to meet many artists such as Giacometti and Zadkin. In the beginning, I had the studio next to Brancusi. I visited him and artists from all over the world frequently. Paralyzed down one side of her body following a stroke, Sashana now lives in a rest home in Vienna. Visited and cared for by her son Amos and various young artists and art students eager to listen to her and her many memories. I was in Paris with him at the time. Although her left hand is paralyzed, Sashana continues to paint almost every day. In the course of her life, the artist has created more than 3,000 oil paintings and 9,000 works on paper. Most of these pieces are privately owned or in museums across the world. Uh, 
Sashana was finally honored in her native Austria in 2009, when she was awarded the Gold Merit Award of the province of Vienna. In 2010, she received the Austrian Cross of Honor for Science and Art. I would love to be a bird so I could fly a long way away from here. Thirtieth of November, 2012, in Vienna's Ottokring district. This building is home to several refugees and for a brief period, the venue for a very special exhibition. Sashana, I am okay, is curated by the young artist Hua Luo and her colleague Leon Naffin, and presents Sashana's most recent works in an unusual environment. Her latest works are her best representation of herself, and I wanted the way the paintings are exhibited to be confusing, without titles. Sashana herself did not want titles, sometimes preferring just to write something that reflected her feelings. I find these pieces more authentic than her earlier work, because the Sashana of the past doesn't exist anymore. She's changed a lot, maybe due to age. My approach was very personal, as I got to know her and also introduced her to Leon. He helped me to curate the exhibition and choose the paintings. We both felt that Soshana and her work deserved to be seen in a new light.